This is CBC Here and Now. All eyes on Hurricane Teddy. I'll have the latest coming up. I'll take you inside the courtroom where a police officer is standing trial on a sexual assault charge. That's coming up. As far as staff goes, we've downsized our staff. We've also trimmed our hours back uh, just because without the tourism season, we found that we weren't getting the volume um, on a five, six day a week basis. Cutting back during COVID, new stats show how hard the hospitality industry has been hit. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Peter Cowan. We start tonight in St. John's with a disturbing home invasion. A convicted sex offender is in custody tonight, charged with attacking a girl under the age of 18. Stephen Hopkins is facing a string of offenses, including break and enter, sexual assault and forcible confinement. Here's what we know. Police received a report that a man forced his way into a Cowan Heights home on Friday morning around 9 a.m. and that the girl was sexually assaulted. Officers, including the RNC's Child Abuse and Sexual Assault Unit, later arrested Hopkins nearby. Police say the teenage girl did not know the man who assaulted her. According to the telegram, Hopkins was sentenced in July for sexually assaulting women last year on Long Pond Trail near the university campus. Because he had been in custody following last year's arrest, Hopkins was sentenced to time served and released from custody two months ago. Back in 2014, Hopkins appeared in court after stabbing a man in the Cowan Heights area. A judge ruled Hopkins acted in self-defense. Well, also in court today, a police officer accused of sexual assault gave his version of the encounter. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary officer says the woman was willing and seemed sober. A warning, though, the following report contains graphic descriptions that may be disturbing to some people. Reporter Malone Mullen has more. Doug Snellgrove started off confident, gesturing from the witness box, explaining how a woman he didn't know approached his squad car one December night in 2014. She repeatedly asked for a ride home, he said. Eventually, he gave in and drove to her St. John's apartment. Just minutes later, he found himself having sex with her. That's how Snellgrove's account unfolded Tuesday. A similar series of events to how the complainant painted that night, but a much different take on who initiated physical contact. The woman can't be named. She was 21 at the time and testified last week that she was so drunk she can't remember consenting to any sexual act. She recalls the two kissing, then a blank, then Snellgrove on top of her. Snellgrove's story attempted to fill in those blanks for the jury. According to him, she pulled him towards the couch. I asked her what she liked, he said, and she said anything. Crown attorney Lloyd Strickland pressed Snellgrove to explain why he entered the woman's home, even after testimony that stated he, quote, just really wanted to get rid of her. Snellgrove said she was the one to kiss him. Strickland pointed out the height discrepancy between them. The Crown repeatedly pointed out Snellgrove did not notify headquarters he had a female passenger in the car, as per RNC policy. It wasn't a police task, he said. There was no reason to do so. You didn't call in because you saw there might be an opportunity with this woman, the Crown suggested. No, he answered firmly, that is not the case. Snellgrove did express remorse about what happened in the witness box today, but that remorse was for his wife, not for the complainant, who he says was a willing partner who appeared sober. Testimony continues this week. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, if you had COVID-19 or you think you may have it, immunologists at Memorial University want you, or at least a little bit of your blood. They're researching what sort of immunity people have long after the disease is gone. We need to know, are people who have had the infection and made immunity, are they safe against future infection? And we need to know exactly what types of immune responses an effective vaccine needs to induce in order to protect the population. Why is this information so crucial when it comes to dealing with COVID-19? Well, we'll have that answer a little later on here and now. Well, COVID-19 has had a big impact on the hospitality industry and they're just assessing the damage it's inflicted on places like restaurants and rentals this summer. As here and now's Heather Gillis reports, new numbers paint a grim picture. 
At Chinched Restaurant in Delhi, co-owner Michelle LeBlanc says 60 to 70 percent of business depends on tourism. This year, with far fewer tourists and dining rooms at half capacity, LeBlanc said they had to reduce their staff by about 10. Um, we've also trimmed our hours back uh, just because without the tourism season, we found that we weren't getting the volume um, on a five, six day a week basis. Numbers from Hospitality NL show the effect COVID-19 is having on restaurants like LeBlanc's. In 2019, they say there were 17,000 restaurant jobs, nearly 7.5% of the province's workforce. This spring, 5,200 jobs in both food services and accommodations were dropped. Steve Denty is the chair of Hospitality NL. Without the wage subsidy from a federal level, I suspect you'd see a lot of restaurants who just wouldn't have been able to open even in peak season. They also say almost 70% of restaurants in the country were losing money in June. About a third don't expect to be profitable in the next 6 to 12 months. Restaurants have thin margins at the best of times. The average restaurant in the province makes about $30,000 in profit before tax. And with COVID-19, spending at restaurants is way down. Before the pandemic, people were spending about seventy dollars to $80,000 a month at restaurants in the province. That dropped down to $30,000 in April and has since rebounded to about $50,000. As summer gets most tourism operators through a lean winter, Denty says other industries outside hospitality will feel it. There's food suppliers and, and, and other grocery outlets and stuff that are affected by the downturn in all this. It's all cyclical. It's not just about tourism and hospitality. Denty says the tourism industry can't survive without travelers from out of province, while LeBlanc is holding out hope for next year. Basically now we're all kind of, I think, holding our breath and hoping that next summer uh, works itself out. With a rough summer now behind us, many in the hospitality industry are now turning their attention to the uncertainty and the unknowns that the coronavirus pandemic will continue to bring throughout the fall and winter. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, restaurants aren't the only ones feeling the pandemic pinch. We all know there's been less travel. We've seen stories about empty airports and fewer flights, but now we have the numbers to back it up. In April and May, the number of passengers traveling through the St. John's International Airport port, rather, dropped 95%. It picked up a little bit over the summer, but not much. In June, inbound travel was down 92%. The airport's busiest months, July and August, were way below last year. In July, about 22,000 people traveled into St. John's by air. That's down 87% from last year. Numbers were down 84% in August, with less than 30,000 visitors. Another uh, little bit of a chilly start for parts of the province today. We were sitting in those single digits below zero in Badger yet again today. Up through portions of Labrador, relatively mild. 11 degrees this morning in Nain and uh, 10 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now those temperatures did rebound quite beautifully. First day of fall looks very much like the middle of summer through parts of Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay reaching a high near 20 degrees. Then we've got those temperatures in the teens for most of the island 12 degrees here in St. John. So we did see uh, some increasing cloud through the day today. Some showers making their way as well, and that is thanks to what is now uh, Hurricane Teddy. You can see just how large this is. Those rain bands are starting. The first uh, rain bands are starting to move in, and uh, we're going to continue to see that as we head through the overnight tonight. Those winds are going to ramp up as well into the 130 kilometer per hour range, certainly for the rec house area area and temperatures are going to stay mild. So we're looking at 10 to 11 degrees that rain working its way further north as well. Now there is a, a bunch more weather on the way tomorrow, but I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, Metro bus drivers and maintenance workers may be heading to the picket line next month. The city of St. John says contract negotiations are at a standstill. Both sides say they hope to avoid a strike, but as here announced, Jeremy Eaton reports time is running out. If something doesn't change soon, riders like these will be looking elsewhere for a lift around town. Contract talks have stalled between the city and Metrobus drivers and maintenance staff. The two have been at the table for about a year to get a new bargaining agreement in place. We want to avoid a strike. We feel right now at this time that they're not being fair, not playing fair ball. The union president says his members just want the same as any other city unionized worker. They have a full severance package as a week for every year. They have a day and a half sick leave 
Uh, they have a shift premium for uh, anybody who works after 7 p.m. in the night, which we don't have any of that. The impasse we're at with the, uh, the negotiations right now are in no way reflective of, uh, you know, a disrespect. Councillor Dave Lane says he has a lot of respect for the workers and the city's public transit system. With City Hall facing down a possible $20 million deficit this year, it's going to be tough to find extra money. The city is not in a position to to be enhancing benefits that, that are currently existing. So we've worked through our negotiation teams have been working through a number of issues that really have been agreed in principle. And we're at a final sticking point, which is uh, essentially to, to add an enhancement to a, a benefit. Lane is optimistic that strike action can be avoided, unlike 10 years ago, when workers walked off the job for about 13 weeks. We've been making motions toward, uh, you know, other options that might be able to fulfill what they're hoping to achieve with that benefit and, and, you know, if there's some other ways we can do that. So I feel that there is still some wiggle room. The news from City Hall comes in the midst of the COVID-19 global pandemic, one where Metro bus staff continued working, getting behind the wheel to shuttle passengers around town. We were there for the members of the public and the low income people who and the essential workers just trying to get to work. And we were there for him. Churchill says that the union will hold a strike vote this coming Sunday just to see where they stand. However, both he and the city of St. John's are hopeful the two sides can come to an agreement. If not, they've set a date of October 5th to go on strike, meaning buses like this one will be off the road. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. And we have an update on the Dominion strike. Workers have been on the picket line now for more than a month, and it seems the sides are still at a stalemate. The union says Loblaw isn't willing to negotiate and isn't offering anything more than its initial deal. Loblaw didn't respond to CBC's request for comment. Dominion employs more than 1,400 workers at 11 locations in the province. Well, we have a doozy of a lotto win in St. John's to tell you about. More than $18 million. The 649 draw happened a week and a half ago, but the winning couple picked up their check today. Here now's Mark Quinn was there. 2020. It's been a year of nothing going as planned. Oh, I Francois Xavier Morancy and Nicole Parsons' lives have taken an unexpected turn too, but it's a good one. Yeah, I, that was that moment when I found out it was $18.2 million. Like, whoever thinks they're going to win. Here's how it happened. Parsons' first clue was the eyes of the store clerks checking her ticket. They were printing out a piece of paper, and then I saw the eyes go wide for the two guys working there, and um, they said, I think you're going to want to sit down. And they just slid the paper across the counter, and I looked at it and just, I was in complete shock. I didn't know if I was going to cry. I didn't know if I was going to hyperventilate because I had my mask on, and so it was really hard to breathe. <laughs> Next step, so, breaking the news to Morancy. And I drove very carefully home. And uh, Francois had just gotten home from the gym and he was just going in through the door and he was like, you're not at the gym because I was just there and you're here. And I said, yeah. And I got inside the garage so that anyone couldn't hear outside and I just went like, we won the lottery. And he was like, what? And I said, $18.2 million, we won the lottery. And here they are checking their bank account for the first time since their millions were deposited. It doesn't fit on the screen. <laughs> Parsons, who's a human resources manager and a volunteer on the board of Choices for Youth, plans to retire from work and spend more time volunteering. Moran C., who works at a shipping company, says he'll retire early too. Both say they want to take care of their parents and spend more time with their families. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Wow. Congratulations <laughs> to them. One thing you didn't hear in those places they're going to spend money is no trips. Yeah. Which in the middle of a pandemic, you know, that's usually one of the top things. Everyone says, you know, I want to take a trip to Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is probably not the time to do it. No, unless you want to take a trip to a deserted island. <laughs> Maybe that's the idea right now. Buy your own <laughs> island, make it part of Canada so it's not international <laughs> travel, part of the Atlantic bubble, done. <laughs> Here's
here's a live look at our rooms camera there. You can see a little bit of a gray evening with some showers. This is thanks to the outer bands of what is now Hurricane Teddy. I'll have all the details on what to expect coming up. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. And uh, Ashley, we have a big tropical storm on the way, but uh, temperature wise, it certainly didn't feel very tropical <laughs> today. It was chilly out there. It was a little chilly, certainly here in St. John's. We saw temperatures just barely reaching the double digits. Let's take a look at those numbers across the province. 10 degrees uh, right now, certainly in, uh, or currently rather, in St. John's. And then we've got those temperatures in the teens across 
most of the island and then into that 20 degree range again up through uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Still sitting there. Beautiful evening uh, on tap tonight for you as far as temperatures go. But we did see all of that cloud cover move in. This is the uh, current situation. We we're under that ridge of high pressure for most of yesterday. That's moved off and that's allowing these outer rain bands from Hurricane Teddy to move further north. And that's what we're seeing right now. A large area uh, being affected by Hurricane, what is now Hurricane Teddy. So again, just like last night, this will update in a little bit. But for now, it's still being uh, categorized as a hurricane, uh, category two hurricane with sustained winds of 160 kilometers per hour. It is weakening and it is transitioning to a post tropical storm as we speak. And you can tell by just how large the uh, precipitation field is and where we're seeing that. That classic comma shape is what we look for uh, when we see these low pressure systems. So as we head through the night tonight, it's still very well south of no uh, Nova Scotia and it's going to track a little bit further uh, north as we head towards the morning hours. That's when it should make landfall somewhere between Halifax and the eastern portions of Nova Scotia. Then you'll see these rain bands, which will be heavy at times, will start affecting or is going to affect us uh, through the overnight. And then into tomorrow afternoon, it'll head towards and just west of Newfoundland and eventually through the northern peninsula and out over uh, the Atlantic as we head Head into Thursday morning. So it is going to be the uh, quite or a uh, busy next couple of uh, 24 to 48 hours. Here's where the, the current track is. That's what I was talking about, about it hasn't moved much since yesterday. So anything to the south of that again is where we'll see those gusty winds. But in this cone, um, the certainty is going to get a lot less or more essentially as we head through the overnight. So we'll see just a slight area of uh, these heavier winds, but this is where we're more than likely going to see it. Anywhere from 90 to 110 kilometer per hour winds expected tonight and into uh, the afternoon on Wednesday. Otherwise, gusty winds and rain will continue. So we do have a number of warnings in place right now. Tropical storm warning for the southwest. That's where we'll see the majority of the impacts from this. Rainfall warnings extending down through the southern portion of the Avalon and then a special weather statement in effect still for uh, southeastern portions of Labrador. And that's because you could see upwards of about 60 millimeters of rain. With this, we're also going to see a push of warm air, humid as well. So we're looking at uh, anywhere from 7 to as much as 22 degrees tomorrow afternoon. You'll, there's where Teddy will be tomorrow afternoon. And we're looking at uh, southeasterlies gusting 40 to 60 and even higher uh, down along the rec house area where you could see upwards of about 130 kilometers per hour. It won't last very long though. And then uh, eventually we'll start to see those winds ramp up across the province. Here's that warning, like I said tonight. Then again tomorrow night in uh, that secondary as it uh, as Teddy approaches us a little bit more. The other thing to note is uh, storm surge and uh, the waves that we're going to see. So anywhere from six to nine meter waves. This puts us through to tomorrow afternoon where we're going to see uh, this coincide with high tide and then again. Uh, as we head into the afternoon on Wednesday. So we could see uh, that in combined with that high tide is uh, likely going to see some potential damage anyway uh, along the south shore there. As far as rainfall goes, still looking at the most happening along the southern portion of the island. Uh, could see in excess of 100 millimeters of rain, but a good bet is anywhere from 50 to 75. And then that special weather statement uh, still in effect. And that's why we're going to see that heaviest rain on the outer bands of uh, Teddy as it moves through. Into Thursday, we're looking at things staying gusty through the day. Uh, temperatures will still be quite mild, though, anywhere from 15 to 18 degrees as we continue to see that west or southwesterly flow. And then uh, some cooler temperatures up through Labrador. So you're looking at about four degrees for Lab City and then the showers and rain will eventually taper off uh, through the day on Thursday and into Friday. Ridge of high pressure moves in and that means that we're going to see some nicer weather. Temperatures still staying quite mild, 16 to 18 degrees and plenty of sunshine. Winds will certainly ease and then we still have those cooler temperatures expected for Lab City sitting around five degrees as we head through 
through the afternoon. Going forward, this is what we're looking at. If that ridge of high pressure holds, we're looking at temperatures about 18 to 21 degrees. I'd say that's a pretty beautiful first weekend of fall with a potential uh, or with lots of sunshine on tap with overnight lows into the teens. And it looks like a similar situation might see a few showers through central and western Newfoundland as we head through the day on Saturday. But overall, it is looking like a, a, a nice weekend for the most part. Up through eastern Labrador, you're looking at temperatures into the teens as well through Friday, Saturday, and then some rain moving in on Sunday with the overnight lows dipping into those single digits. And then the potential for some flurries will stick around pretty much through Friday for you in Lab West, and then uh, back to that potential for some rain for the rest of the weekend. Okay, take a look at this beautiful shot. Last summer sunset last night in Lethbridge and April Churchill shared uh, that lovely shot with us. And if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. So as you heard Ashley say, lots of wind and rain coming from parts of southwestern Newfoundland and southeastern Labrador. So what's being done to prepare for all of this weather? Joining me now to talk more about that is Justice and Public Safety Minister Steve Crocker. So Minister Crocker, can you talk about some of the preparations that are underway in anticipation of this weather? Yeah, so I would have just left a briefing at Fire and Emergency Services. And, you know, they're making the contacts right now. Uh, we're in regular contact with the uh, Hurricane Center in Halifax and watching the storm as it gets closer. You know, contacts will be made with municipalities and other agencies in the region. You know, the, the majority of this storm, it looks like tomorrow, will be on the southwest coast. Uh, storm surge is one of the biggest concerns right now, and that will be primarily from the Buren Peninsula West. So the necessary precautions will be taken overnight and into the day tomorrow and really watch what's happening, I guess, in Nova Scotia would be what we would do right now and get a much more clearer picture early tomorrow uh, what the impacts are going to be on the west coast. And what sorts of precautions are being taken right now? So typically, you know, municipalities are out cleaning their drains, uh, you know, transportation and infrastructure are out looking at road infrastructure. And we'd ask, we'd ask people, we'd ask residents to, you know, make sure your drains and make sure your yards are clear of debris. You know, if there's something left on that patio deck from this summer, tie it down or put it away. And uh, those precautions, if we all look around our own situations, our own environments, it will make for a much safer uh, outcomes. What can people do at home to prepare for this storm? Anytime we get into a storm situation, you know, we should always think about 72 hours. We could easily see power disruptions, winds in the 130 kilometer hour range. So you keep that and you make sure that your, uh, your sub pumps are working. And same with municipalities, make sure their drains are cleared. And you know, we'll do our part. We'll work, work with fire departments and emergency officials in the communities affected. And we'll monitor it very closely. Minister, it wasn't too long ago that you were the Minister of Transportation and Work, so you're pretty familiar with the province's roadways. Absolutely. <laughs> How confident are you in the infrastructure in those areas to be able to handle all of this rain? Well, we see it. We've seen it this past weekend. We had some issues down around the, the southern Avalon area. You know, transportation and infrastructure were quick to get in there and fix it. Uh, you know, it's becoming, I guess, all too often that we're seeing this, but, you know, uh, we respond, you know, departments like transportation respond very rapidly, as rapidly as we can. But you would take, like, this situation this past weekend uh, in North Harbor, I know they were isolated for, for some time, but in my briefing this afternoon, I was told that, you know, as they're isolated overnight, you know, we had made contact with the, the Joint Rescue Center in Halifax to make sure that if there was an emergency, we could get crews in there to get somebody out. Are there any extra measures being put in place to try to prevent, you know, flooding and washouts, the same sorts of things that we saw like in Placentia? Well, I guess a lot of that are things that we can't control because until you actually get the amount of runoff that we would have had this past weekend in Placentia, we don't, you know, we can't see those things coming. Our culverts and bridges are inspected on a regular basis, but unfortunately, when you see those those water surges, you know, we can't predict exactly where they're going to be. So, and they will always find a weakness in the system, but the best we can do is respond as quickly as we can. All right, Minister Crocker, thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. How long after you have COVID-19 do you have immunity? It's one of the key questions of this disease. Find out why this researcher at Memorial University is trying to answer it.
The question of how long you're immune from COVID-19 after you have it is something that scientists are still figuring out. Michael Grant is an immunologist here at Memorial University, and he's one of the scientists who's looking at that here in this province. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome. What is it you're exactly that you're looking at here? The mystery is two-part mystery. One is what type of immunity does somebody need to make in order to be protected against severe illness if they do contract COVID? And the second part is if they do make that type of immunity, how long will it last and protect them against future infection? So how are you going about studying this? We are going to recruit as many people in Newfoundland who've been infected with COVID-19 as positive, possible. And we're gonna take blood samples. We're gonna look at their antibody responses. We're gonna look at their cellular responses against uh, COVID-19. And we're gonna relate those to the severity of infection that they experience. So I guess the idea is figuring out if you had a just milder form, does that affect your resistance to COVID again in the future? Two questions again, if you had milder form, is it because you made a better immune response? Or it, do you need to have actually had severe infection in order to generate a very strong immune response that lasts longer? So what's the response been like? The reaction's been very good. Interestingly though, about half the people who have responded are people who believe they may have had COVID-19 before March and uh, so weren't tested. Even if people didn't test positive, you're still interested in talking to them? We're interested in those people. It would be interesting to find that the virus had been here bef before March, for sure. And if they have antibodies, then we'll, we'll enroll them in a study and follow them, same as everyone else. So why is this issue so important? It's incredibly important to know, to work out the future of a vir how we're going to deal with a virus that everybody expects to be around for, for five years. We need to know, are people who have had the infection and made immunity, are they safe against future infection? We need to know exactly what types of immune responses an effective vaccine needs to induce in order for, to protect the population. Why did you want to look into this area of research in particular? Well, I've been an immunologist for, for 30 years, and to be honest, uh, when the epidemic, pandemic started, I was, uh, went to the sidelines like everyone else and thought I might just stay there because I study different kind of viruses. But I got involved in the, a local task force that was, response, what was trying to help with uh, testing, uh, making sure that we had enough reagents for the testing, that everybody could get tested who needed to. To, and then we gradually formed a group of people who were really interested in, in studying it. Uh, I have a colleague, Dr. Russell, who's part of the team grant, who's a virologist. So we, we make a good team to study immunology and, and virology. And it, this, is a, this is a great population. Although it's not that many infections, it's a great population to study because they're concentrated in St. John's mostly. Uh, they're very willing to participate in, in trials. And uh, the one cluster, the CALS cluster, is actually one of the biggest clusters of infection in Canada. When do you expect you'll have your first look at uh, some of the results? Well, we've looked a little bit already just uh, in order to develop the assays that we need. I think probably within a couple of months we'll have a picture of uh, does everybody who's infected make immunity? Is it stable? Because there will be people in the study who were infected six months ago and we'll at least know if it's stable for, for six months. So I'd say by, I'm hoping by Christmas we'll have a picture of where we're going. Well, thank you very much for joining me and telling me all about your research. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. While COVID-19 cases are spiking in parts of Canada right now, flu season is also coming up fast. In Ontario, pediatricians are sounding an alarm. They say it's more critical than ever for children to get their flu shots. But the doctors say they need more support to meet that demand. The CBC's Lauren Pelly reports. Flu shot clinics are often busy. This year, with the double whammy of COVID-19, physicians are bracing for even higher demand. We're getting more phone calls than ever. This Woodbridge pediatrician says last year alone, his office gave up to 5,000 children their flu shots. COVID-19 now makes that impossible. So the question is, how do we do this? And just in a regular office, we've found that it's 
probably going to be impossible to give the same number of immunizations in the same way that we've done before. Patients piling into a clinic wouldn't be safe. Physical distancing and rigorous cleaning also slow the process down. Ontario pediatricians are now asking for more public health support to safely set up large-scale flu clinics, which could operate more like this, a drive-through COVID-19 test site. We need a clear plan as to how we're going to do this that is feasible and well supported. Several hundred pediatricians with the Ontario Medical Association have signed a petition warning that without action, there could be a vaccination crisis. We had a, a, a huge year last year, over 4.4 million Ontarians were vaccinated, but we want it even higher this year. Ontario's health minister says pharmacies will be carrying part of the vaccination load. This is important for entire families to, uh, to receive the flu vaccine so we can prevent the transmission. But as of right now, Ontario pharmacists can't give the flu shot to kids under five. The province is also banking on mask wearing and physical distancing to keep flu rates down. But COVID cases are rising despite those efforts. Many pediatricians remain concerned. What happens if you have influenza and then an otherwise healthy child gets COVID-19? What happens after that? And the answer is, we don't fully understand and we don't fully know that yet. But the best thing to do would be to avoid that situation as much as possible. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Well, back to the topic of COVID-19, public health officials are warning that Canada's rising COVID-19 numbers could get even worse. Ottawa released new modeling today on the pandemic's projected growth. It suggests that if things don't change and the country remains on its current trajectory, cases will resurge. CBC's Hannah Thibodeau has the details. We need to ramp up the defences and stop a big resurgence from occurring. Canada's top doctor says the country is at a crossroads when it comes to battling the COVID-19 pandemic. New modelling data shows there's been a big growth in daily cases, about 1,058, and that's up drastically since August, when it was just 380 being reported each day. This acceleration in epidemic growth is concerning, and the situation will continue to escalate further unless public health and individual protective measures are strengthened. Most infections are Canadians aged 20 to 39, and on average for every 100 cases, they're passing it on to 140 new people. So health officials are saying to limit contact with others, in particular young people. We have to get better at saying no uh, more than yes to the invitations that we're receiving to gather uh, for barbecues in the backyard or, uh, you know, parties uh, to celebrate occasions, uh, gatherings and, and, you know, that are bringing people together. As for another strict lockdown like Canadians saw in the spring, officials aren't ready to do that just yet. Every uh, medical officer of health, as well as uh, politicians at all levels, realize that there is an economic and a social cost to pay for broad and sweeping lockdowns. And that is why I think the approach of really trying to tamp down these hot spots. They say restrictions will target areas that are seeing increased cases, like in Ontario or Quebec. The Canadian government also announced it has signed a deal with a French pharmaceutical to get 72 million doses of its vaccine candidate. This is in addition to what Canada has already done to secure a vaccine. It's inked a deal with four other companies as well. This is to ensure that Canadians have quick access to a vaccine once it's passed all its trials and has been approved by Health Canada. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa.
Tomorrow is a big day for the Liberal government in Ottawa. The speech from the throne will lay out plans for fighting the pandemic and getting the country back on track. And as David Cochran reports, the Prime Minister is adding something extra. There have been agreements and differences. The Governor General reads the speech from the throne, but unlike years past, Julie Payette will not have the last word. Sources tell CBC News Justin Trudeau intends to address the nation tomorrow night, asking TV networks for airtime. With Payette mired in controversy and under investigation, with the country in a health and economic crisis, the Prime Minister is keen to be the prime messenger for his COVID recovery plan. The speech will focus on three broad themes, health care spending to control the spread of COVID-19, continuing financial support for Canadians and businesses struggling through the pandemic, and economic rebuilding with an acute focus on green investments. We put forward our two demands. But it's a minority parliament and the opposition has demands. Extend CERB, put in place a new program that doesn't cut the help they receive, and make sure every Canadian has access to paid sick leave. That's what we're asking for. Sources say measures along those lines will be in there along with money for long-term care to address the failures that led to the vast majority of COVID deaths in Canada. There's also money for child care to ensure more parents, especially women, can go back to work. So today is about a vision. It's about a vision for our country and economic measures to create more announcements like this, the refit of Ford auto plants in Ontario to make electric cars and batteries. This is a government that's looking to invest in green technology. This is a government. Mostly the speech will have an urgent focus on the health crisis of the moment, with Trudeau bracing Canadians for the long haul, reminding that as cases spike and testing lines grow, life without COVID is a long way off. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the Supreme Court has started two days of hearings on the federal carbon tax. It's to decide if Ottawa has the right to impose a price on pollution on the provinces. The environment is not covered in the Constitution. While today justices asked lawyers from Saskatchewan and Ontario how Canada can help stop climate change if any single province chooses not to help. Those provinces and Alberta argue that Ottawa doesn't have the jurisdiction over the environment. Well, the race is on to save hundreds of stranded pilot whales in Australia. About 300 whales have been found on a beach. Researchers believe that a third of them have already died. Two dozen have been saved and they hope to save more. This is such a tricky event, such a, a complex event, that any whale we save, we're considering a, a real win. Um, so we're focusing on, on uh, you know, having as many survivors as we can. The whales were discovered Monday on a beach and two sandbars on an island off Tasmania. Authorities aren't sure why or how they became stranded. More than 65 state park workers, fishermen and volunteers are part of the rescue effort. Well, football during the pandemic has been pretty quiet here in Canada, but a team in Saskatoon is using the time away to break a 99-year-old tradition and introduce a new player. CBC's Fiona Odlum has the story. Honestly, just feel like I'm living a movie or a dream or something because I just, yeah, it's weird to think that it's actually me that it's happening to. <laughs> just thought I was going to keep playing women's football. It wasn't really on my radar at all. Emma Raydale is making history. The standout Western Women's Canadian Football League linebacker has earned a shot to play with the top junior men's team in Canada. Well, I think tend to underestimate like the speed and strength that women do have. Like I, I wouldn't be where I am without, you know, the elite program that is the Valkyries and the WWCFL. You know, it's not just a nothing league of you know, average athlete. The 22 year old who stands at five foot six has a physicality and athleticism that helped the Valkyries win two championships in 2016 and 2019. This caught the eye of the Saskatoon Hilltops coaching staff and they offered her a spot on the team, making Dale the first woman to suit up for a Canadian Junior Football League team ever. So when the idea was first kind of brought forward I definitely was pretty shell-shocked and took it as a huge compliment for sure and it's not anything I'm taking lightly 
at all. Winners of six straight national titles, the Hilltops are the most dominant team in junior football. They say this isn't a gimmick or about breaking gender barriers on the gridiron. It's all about making plays and you know at the end of the day Hilltop football is all about winning so that's what we're looking for and we know she's a winner and so as I said it was a real easy decision to you know get her on this team and now, now it's just a matter of you know seeing exactly where she fits in and, and how she competes. The pandemic has put a stop to games in 2020 but the Hilltops are on the field preparing for 2021. Dale says the transition to playing with men has already helped improve her game. You just kind of have to always make sure that you're diving into the physical aspect of things because you have to sort of assert yourself on the field as a linebacker and hold your ground. So that's kind of been, I think, one adjustment is that you just you can't you can't ever back off. Dale knows stepping out onto the field and donning the Hilltops jersey will show the value women bring to sports and that the next generation of young girls are watching. Fiona Odlum, CBC News, Saskatchewan. Thank you. 
In Atlantic Canada, all eyes are on Teddy. It's not expected to pack the same punch as Dorian did last year, but in Herring Cove, Nova Scotia, one man is bracing for what's to come. Here's CBC's Kayla Hansel. When Tom Rhino heard about Teddy, he had flashbacks. Well, last year when Hurricane Dorian hit, uh, we had the highest sea surge in my lifetime. Herring Cove took a pounding. Rhino lost his wharf, his boathouse, and everything in it. It was a very sickening feeling. It was surreal because you looked around, there was damage everywhere. This year, he's taking extra precautions. His boat's out of the water, he's added rock to weigh things down, and this new dock he just finished rebuilding, he's strapping that down. The Canadian Hurricane Centre is clear. Teddy is not Dorian. It may not land as a hurricane, but that doesn't mean it should be taken lightly. Uh, it's just a designation that we give it so that we can identify kind of the structure that it's going to be having as it moves over our area. But it definitely does not mean that it's going to be a weak storm. Preparations are further complicated by the pandemic. We've been planning for months on how that will work, making sure that we have all the right protective uh, equipment for our crews, as well as proper social distancing. Nova Scotians have experience with power outages that go on for days. We're just buckling down with as much, as much uh, snacks as we can. Anything we don't have to cook or keep in the freezer, right? Prince Edward Islanders are also tracking Teddy. Just going around looking for tree limbs or anything that may be a, a, a reason for concern uh, and having them taken out and removed before the storm. With pretty much everything tied up or tied down, Tom Rhino says there's not much else to do. I don't think there is such a thing as hurricane proof. Um, Mother Nature is going to win every time. He's Teddy ready, but hoping the storm will pass without packing too much of a punch. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Herring Cove, Nova Scotia. So yes, all eyes are on Teddy, and as we head through the night tonight, we are going to start to see the effects of that down through uh, parts of uh, the of Nova Scotia. We'll make landfall in the morning again. Head towards Newfoundland as we head into tomorrow afternoon, where we're going to see the strongest winds in the southwest, 100 and 110, maybe 120 kilometer per hour winds expected. As it tracks across the northern peninsula, it's going to keep that rain, or at least the heaviest rain at that point, uh, towards southwest or southeastern portions of Labrador. Then it moves off and behind that. However, tomorrow will be a gusty day across the province and we'll notice a big warm push of air. So uh, temperatures again anywhere from 17 to 22 degrees, uh, feeling very humid. And then as we head into Thursday, we're looking at temperatures uh, eventually dipping uh, back down. But look at that beautiful day expected for Nain, 16 degrees and some cloud cover. Well, lots of Canadians have been using the downtime during COVID-19 to take on new projects and develop their skills. And a Nova Scotia folk artist is using the lull to develop a whimsical new installation in his front yard. The CBC's Colleen Jones took a short drive up the coast from Halifax to take in the Whirligig Pasture. If you've traveled along Highway Number 7 on the eastern shore, you've likely seen Barry Colpitt's house. Old, old ones here. That angel's pretty old. Jesus himself might be the most obvious carving, but let's not forget his other friends. Patricia. Patricia? Yeah. Patricia Ryan. And my grade three teacher there. Really? Then there's this, his head museum. That, uh, that one there is Anne. I head with Barry to his workshop where the magic happens. Yeah. Workshop here, one of them. The Wind Powered Skinny Lady Beauty Contest. Got my flying bird chair. It's your what? My flying bird chair. See, when you sit in that, it's like you're flying with a flock of birds. No power tools? Ah, uh, no. Rather, his go to tool is bird this here. horse knife. He's chipping away at the wood to form a wind catcher. It'll look like, uh, like that one there. Friend of mine, Anne, holding up uh, her. Now, making whirly gigs is something he always like wanted to do, but it took the lockdown and pandemic there. to nudge him in this and direction. It in and it turns uh, the baby's halo and these two flowers behind it. I've just made the odd one, but uh, I thought, well, this year I'm going to get some made this winter. And then the, the disease popped up and then I had all kinds of time. He started building these at the start of the pandemic. He now has made 22 for his whirly gig pasture. Do you have a favorite? Probably this one, uh, Lady's hat, eh? 
It's got a cat on it, and a bird on, on the cat's back. And if you think his art is limited to the exterior, come on into his living room, where his carvings and painted trim and pipes have a Maud Lewis vibe, although he doesn't see it. Maud Lewis here. He became a folk artist to find calm while working as a corrections officer at a jail. This took his mind off that. He left that work in 1996, and 27 years later, he's carved out a living with his art. Although COVID has shut down the usual craft and folk art shows, he's found his whirligig pasture, while it doesn't bring him money, does bring a smile to anyone who stops by. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Tangier. It's very colorful. I always like any story that leaves you smiling, especially in these days with the pandemic. So, yep. you know, it's always nice to see when people find an opportunity to use the pandemic to, you know, maybe hopefully take people's minds off something and make them feel a little bit better. And I have to admit, I did not know what a whirly gig was <laughs> until now. Now you do. <laughs> now I know, a whirly gig. <laughs> Means you definitely don't have one in your front yard. You know, maybe tonight <laughs> no. you can go home and start doing a little bit of carving. But you know? they're really nice. I would have one in my yard for sure. <laughs> That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. On Pandemic News, we will have tomorrow's briefing, so stay tuned for that. Good night.